in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning, the first day. God said, let there be space between the waters, between the ocean and the atmosphere, and it was so. God called the space between the waters the sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Then God said, let the dry ground appear. Let the land produce vegetation, plants, trees, and flowers of every kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the sky that separate the day from the night to mark the seasons, the days, and the years to give light on the earth. So he made the sun and the moon, the stars and all the galaxies of the universe. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. God said, let the waters be filled with living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the sky. So God created every creature of the sea and every bird of the sky and saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. Then God said, let the land produce living creatures of every kind, big and small, mighty and meek, wild and tame, each according to its kind. And it was so. Then God said, let us make human beings in our own image to rule over all the earth. So God created them. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And it was so. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. And on the seventh day, God rested. And there on his throne, in heaven, God looked at all that he had made and saw that it was very good. In Genesis 1, God inserts himself as creator. He is the cause, we are the effect. He is the uncaused cause. In this incredible opening of the Bible, it gives the highest view of God. It gives the highest view of humanity. I'm going to speak in a way that I want you to see that it is history and that it aligns in just the way science would set up for life to happen. And I'll just start uh, with this picture of the blue marble, this picture of Earth that was taken by Apollo 17, and it was 50 years ago. And so for 50 years, we have been able to enjoy this picture of Earth, and yet God has been enjoying it since the creation. And I say that to say that the more advanced our tools of science become, they don't lead scientists or anyone away from the Genesis account of creation. They're leading us to the Genesis account of creation. And so that it's catching up with the brilliance, the magnificence of the creative power of God. Hugh Ross is an astrophysicist he wrote the book, The Fingerprint of God. I, I highly recommend it. And he says, when you look at 
the sequence of creation, it makes, and this is, this is the astrophysicist writing, it makes total scientific sense. So in day one, you have the transformation of Earth's atmosphere from opaque to translucent. And that had to happen if life was going to be possible. That's followed by day two, the formation of a stable water cycle. Followed by day three, the establishment of continents and oceans. Also on day three, the production of plants on the continents. Watch how God is outfitting the earth. And then science is gonna come along and say, if you were gonna move to life, this is the way it would have to happen. Day five, transformation of the atmosphere from translucent to transparent. And that is how you and I can look up and see the stars and see the moon and see the sun. On day five, production of sea animals, then sea mammals, followed by the creation of birds, then the making of land mammals, and ultimately the crown of his creation, the creation of mankind. Hugh Ross writes, this makes perfect scientific sense. He said, this is not playing with the facts at all. This is how life would emerge on a planet, just in that order. And I, I wanna keep before us that it holds the highest view of God, this is Genesis 1, and the highest view of humanity. Fred Hoyle, he's a Cambridge University astronomer, he's a mathematician, and I wanna quote from him because he's an atheist. He says, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. The monkey always makes his way in to these stories, as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. This guy has no agenda to write like this. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Another agnostic, Michael Denton, a biochemist and geneticist, he says, is it really credible that random processes could have constructed reality, the smallest element of which, a functional protein or gene, is complex beyond our creative capacities? A reality which is the very antithesis, the opposite he's writing, the opposite of chance, an agnostic saying, this is beyond some random chemical reaction, which excels in every sense anything produced by the intelligence of man. He goes on to say it reflects a genius beyond chance. And I think there's no better place than to quote Robert Jastrow right here, an astronomer, planetary physicist, and again, someone who doesn't believe like Christians, he's an agnostic. He says, for the scientists who have lived by faith, by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance like he's just getting smarter and smarter. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself up over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. And do you know what they're saying? Here's what they say. In the beginning, God. So if I just laid in this talk with all of these believers, you would say, well, they have an agenda. But I just quoted from three people that have no agenda to push us toward Genesis 1. They don't believe as in Jesus Christ as their savior. And yet they all stand there and say, the more we learn, the more advanced our tools of science are, it doesn't lead us away saying, we know Genesis 1 isn't true. It's pushing them more and more to it. And then Hugh Ross, the believer says, even though Genesis 1 predates science, what we know now says, 
it makes perfect scientific sense that that's the way it would happen. Romans chapter one, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. He's saying, as you look, you say, all of this had to start and there had to be a starter in the beginning, God. We are moving into facts and fascination of all that God is and what he's done. And I want you to allow your mind just to be gripped by the magnificence of God. I can't convince you. I can't convince the unconvinced. I can't jazz the unjazzed. If the Lord doesn't work, then there won't be any work accomplished. I stand up here every weekend with the confidence that there's more at work than just me standing here talking. There is something at work by the presence of God and the word of God. And that will move in such a way as to confront doubt or fear, inferiority, insecurity, guilt over the past, fear over the future. While we are talking about the magnificence of our creator God, there can be a work where no one in this place leaves the way that they came. And you praise God for that today. It's the truth. Three weeks ago, we were in a passage of scripture and God was, was at work through that passage. And just in the unfolding days of that passage, God was doing things and we just said, you know, there's, there's no limit to what God could do even in the next seven days. And we just looked at what God did in seven days in Genesis one. And when I made that statement, like be, be aware, I'm believing over the next seven days, there was someone who lives in Iowa who was watching online that day. A pastor's, wife's, a pastor's wife whose adult daughters are away from God. And she said, when the statement was made, you know, believing over the next seven days that significant things could happen. She said seven days later, one of those daughters walked into church and rededicated her life to Jesus. And this is a young lady through various circumstances had basically been overcome with, with so many questions that there was just a work of deconstruction going on in her faith. There were any number of factors that were contributing to that. But I respect this young lady for bringing her doubts to the Lord, to God, who welcomes your doubts, who will process with you through your doubts, just like he did with Thomas. And Thomas went from doubter to one of the greatest missionaries India has ever known. And I just wanna say, if God could do what we just saw in seven days, if God could do for that pastor's wife's daughter what he did, I just feel like somebody's on day seven right now and that today is gonna be a turning point for you. You're not here by accident. You're here with purpose. And I believe that this is gonna set in motion something of significance for you, you to place faith, a faith-filled expectation on what God can do as you go forward into your future. Amen, church? So consider with me the creation of God. Let's see his invisible qualities. Let's see his eternal qualities and divine nature. And let's just start with the sun. The sun is 93 million miles away. It's hard to even comprehend that. And from the moment that sunlight leaves the sun it travels in just eight minutes to where you and I feel the effect. Just amazing. The surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees. At the core, it's 27 million degrees. So it kind of puts this summer in perspective, doesn't it? It's not so bad after all. Could it be any hotter? It could. Sun is massive. 
It's a star. It's not even the largest star in our galaxy. But do you know that it's a million times larger than Earth? One of billions of stars just in this one galaxy. And if we could travel from one side of our galaxy to the next, and we could travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per hour, like, that would be awesome. It would only take us 100,000 years. Now, for parents who've been on a road trip with your kids, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, are we there yet? No. Nope. But we're going so fast, it seems like we'd be there by now. No, we're, we're, we're just 50,000 years uh, closer. Uh, just the magnificence of God. One galaxy among two trillion galaxies. That's why the Bible said it way before we knew any of this, that even the heavens declare the glory of God. God made the stars, the Bible says, and he placed them with his hand. And this is incredible. He calls each of them by name. I would love to hear that. God placed in them. And we think in the realm of what we see uh, tonight, if, if it's a clear night, just look at the stars and think about the God who made each one of them. Think about those stars being so much larger than what the mind can actually comprehend. And think that this is one galaxy and we're so limited by even what we see of this galaxy and there are two trillion other galaxies. Psalm 145 says, nothing compares with the might and the power of God. There is the water cycle. It's a perpetual water cycle. The vapor rises from the ocean and it fills into the atmosphere. It then enters into the clouds and the clouds, they move across the continents and the rain falls. When you see the lightning, a streak of lightning can go as far as five miles and when that lightning hits the raindrops, it fills the raindrops with nitrogen so that when those raindrops hit the ground, it becomes fertilizer, like the kind of science, the kind of creation down to the detail. And then there's snow. I've thought a lot about snow this summer. I do love snow. I don't like it on Sunday. But I'm fine if it, can, if it cancels work or school, let it snow. Sunday, let it melt, come to church, then let it snow. These ice crystals are formed in the highest of our atmosphere, and then as they descend, according to humidity and temperature, they fall to the earth, and you know, no two are alike. Never been the same. The brilliance, the creative genius of God, that not even one snowflake, like who would even care? And yet, to God, it matters, and no two are the same. And so as that snow begins to melt as winter gives way to spring. It comes down the mountain into streams, into rivers, ultimately back to the ocean, and the cycle starts again. As the spring happens, a lot happens. The tree that was in the backyard of the home where we used to live in the wintertime, it just, it looked like it had no future. But yet there was something going on that you couldn't see. And there was something within that root system that the circumstance of winter could not affect. And when spring came, life. A seed that gets planted in the ground, it gets nutrients and pollinators and water and it starts to grow. But here's what fascinates me. In, in that seed, there is loaded the information that tells the root system, now you grow down and it tells the stalk, now you grow up. And then when harvest comes, while you enjoy the harvest, yet you have extra seed. 
and you can take that seed, and as it's planted, ultimately you get acres and acres and acres of crops. You go, how did this happen? Just read Genesis 1:11. It's right there, word for word. Then there's the ocean. It's where we get Nemo. Some three million species, the color, the depths, the communication system. How phenomenal. And yet, if you take the sun, the earth, the galaxy, the water cycle, if you take the ocean, if you take seed, time, and harvest, all of the creative brilliance in those combined do not compare with the creation of you. You are the crown of God's creation. And I'm saying, backed by scripture and science, you are a miracle, an absolute miracle. Just your DNA, if someone was to read it, it would take 100 years. One strand of your DNA has the capacity to contain information more than all information we've ever stored on any database. All databases combined can't hold the information that could be contained in one strand of your DNA. The word of the Lord, the Bible, God put it there. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let that challenge inferiority, insecurity, loneliness, fear, if you feel forgotten, if you lack purpose, I wanna tell you, God has not forgotten you. God knows where you are, and God made you for a purpose. God has a purpose, and we're gonna see later in this message, by his work, anything that has happened up to this point, it doesn't disqualify you for the purpose of God over your life. Can you praise him for that? That's, that's the hope that's in all of this. One cell from your mother holding, what is it, 26 chromosomes? Or is it 23? We don't want to get 26. 23, one cell from your dad with 23 chromosomes that get together and creates one cell so small that you, you can hardly see it under the greatest microscope. And yet in that one cell is all of the information needed to create you. your personality, your intellect, your gift mix, your skill set. I am standing here today using a gift that God gave me and he wove it in to the fabric of who he made me to be. And then along the way, he's good enough to put his presence and his power on the gift. When you woke up this morning, and unless you've never been here, you didn't use GPS to get you here. You didn't even think about it. You just know your mind was at work. Your eyes are seeing all of these colors. Your ears are hearing what is being said. There's a visual miracle happening. There's an auditory miracle happening. We, we hardly ever pause to even think about it. And simultaneously, what you see, what you hear is without you even realizing it, you're able to form response, ideas. You're able to sense even the atmosphere of the room. Things that we never talk about. Your heart is beating. Air is filling your lungs and blood's flowing through miles and miles of blood vessels. The miracle of you. All that other, it doesn't compare with the creation of you. A rocket scientist was given the Bible and he, he was asked, would you read it and make a summary? And here's his summary after reading it. 
God is the creator. And the creator, creator God, acted in such a way to become the redeemer. Because creation won't save you. You can look at the stars and you can stand at oceans. You can go to the mountains. You, you can take in the creation of God, but it will never have the power to forgive your sins, to make you a new person. So God, who created it all, he had to act in such a way to be a redeemer because in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned. It's called the fall of man. That fall racked humanity, and that is why from there forward, anyone born was conceived in sin. This is very important to know. You don't, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Shaped in iniquity. That's how deep and significant this fall was. It, it moved through humanity with what's called a fallen nature. We're separated from God. And from Genesis 3, the moment it happened, God, creator God didn't say, what was I thinking? Why did I create them? He immediately acted in such a way to start pointing to the day that creator would be redeemer. And so God so loved the world that you and me, that he would give his only son and Jesus would give his life. Now, now, this is why I say Genesis 1 is the highest view of God and the highest view of humanity because I just told you that at the center of Christianity is God giving his son and Jesus giving his life. You won't find that in any other religion. And if you were Israel hearing this way back in the day, the only concept of gods that you had were gods that manipulated and exacted from you and worked in such a way for you to end up in slavery. And so God, Yahweh God, comes along, gives his son and Jesus, who was there at the beginning, you know that in the beginning God, God the Father was there at creation, God the Son was there, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Jesus was there at creation, and the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, Trinity, was all there forming, creating, sequencing, making it all happen. And this God, would give his son and Jesus would give his life. You don't find that anywhere else that at the center, our savior would not consider it robbery to take on the form of man, to leave the perfection of the heavenlies and to become one of us, to be fully God and fully man, satisfying the holiness of God while he literally became sin for us. And with this concept of what I've said today, I want you to hear Paul's words, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that means those who are saved, the new creation has come. Look at that word, creation. When you get saved, it's not about renovation. Now what you've seen in the power of creation in this message, the creative power of God, then just how much power is involved in the gift of salvation? I will tell you because the word tells us so powerful that the old is gone and the new is here. My past is not my future. This fallen, Adamic nature gives way to a new nature. And I become a partaker of the divine nature. And now by spirit and word, I can be transformed. Caterpillar to butterfly is the illustration that Paul used 
something that's kind of creepy and crawling becomes majestic and flying. Paul used that to say, the old is gone and the new has come. This is the power of salvation. Paul goes on to write, look at this. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Do you see it? God acted in such a way for the creator to become our redeemer. God reconciled us to himself through the mediator between God and man. Not a person, but Jesus. Jesus, fully human, fully God. Stay with me today. You and I would stand and we, we couldn't reconcile to God. We were without hope, without help. We could never satisfy the judgment that was placed on sin. We couldn't pay our way through this. And so Jesus comes and he's perfect in his humanity. Yet that perfection satisfied divinity. And we're like, how could we ever be reconciled? Well, you, I'll tell you, you have to die on the cross, but you have to be perfect so that in your sacrifice, it satisfies the penalty of sin, the payment required for sin. And of course, right there, we're like, well, then there's no hope. And into that steps Jesus and says, I'll go to the cross for you. But Jesus, you're God, I know. But I've become man. But Jesus, you're perfect, I know. But I'll take your sin on me. I'll go to the cross. By who I am, it satisfies the holiness of God and it pays for your sin. I'll tell you how Paul said it. Here it is. God made him who had no sin. This should, this should strike us at the deepest level. To be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is very important in this day. Dr. Luke, writing the book of Acts, wrote in chapter 4, there is no other name given among us whereby we can have salvation, receive salvation, other than the name of Jesus because of who he was and what he did. And culture would, would just put you on blast for saying that. But that's okay, because deception is real, and people who are in deception, they can't see this. That's okay, but don't let that influence you. You see it. You see it. Jesus loved you and me enough to die for you and me. He rose again. What I shared to you from Genesis 1, you can say that is the most incredible poetry. It is poetry if you look how it's aligned, but it's also history. And though it predates science, science now says that's the way it would work. There are 600 prophecies pointing to the coming of Jesus. It all happened, time and place and space Jesus isn't a myth. Jesus isn't a concept. He actually had a birth date. He lived, but he lived perfectly and he died. And he rose again so that humanity that had gotten broken beyond repair because of what happened in Genesis 3 could now enter a zone where anybody who cries out on the name of the Lord shall, shall be saved. The door has swung wide open. The hope is here. The love is here. The life is here. That's why I'm saying this could be day seven for somebody like that day where it all changes. Because the power of Jesus 
is magnificent, supernatural power, light at a level there's not a person in their brilliance that could assign the kind of sentence structure with the right words to come close to how awesome he is. And one day, our physical heart will stop. But if you're a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with God. Hey, why are you here? That's a great question. How are you here? Great question. What happens after you die? Great question. Are you more than just flesh and blood? Yes, you are. And the moment your physical heart stops beating, if you're a Christian, your spiritual man goes right into the presence of Jesus. And this God who started working in Genesis 3 to make way for your salvation, he is still at work because all of this is coming to a close. There will be a day where this earth will be no more. The rapture of the church will happen. And then we're gonna be at a place called heaven. And the Bible talks about the gates and the streets and they're, they're incredible. Like the description is gonna have us in awe. And yet if the streets are that magnificent, which who even thinks about a street, right? And if just the streets are that awesome, can you even imagine Paul got to see it and he said, it's beyond my ability to describe. And here is what is so true of heaven that when every single believer walks in, you're gonna look around and say, I'm home. I'm home. Perfection. No more tears because there's no more pain, no more sickness, no more dying. Perfection, home. To every hurting heart, there's hope. To every suffering soul, there's a, a grace that's sufficient. This God who is making all of the order of galaxies move and work as they should this very moment. Your heart beating, breath coming in and out of your lungs, your life functioning, I'm telling you, he watches over a sparrow that falls. How much more, that whole, look at the lily of the field, he clothes them in splendor. It's the argument from the lesser to the greater. That stuff's gonna pass away when it comes to you. How much more, the Bible says, is his attention inclined? Is his love directed? Is his power available? I'm telling you, nothing of the past gets the last word. Nothing of the present gets the last word except the word. Why not surrender, submit gladly, why not walk in the confidence of who you are in God? Why not walk in the peace that you're the creation of God and he made you just the way you are and it's good. And you walk in the confidence of who you are in God and you step into the destiny of God in your life and you do the great exploits that he put in place for you to do. You make a difference with your life and one day when he decides the pages in your book have turned and it's time. You've walked so much, just walk on in to my manifest presence. Come on, there's nothing that compares. There's not a marriage that's struggling that this kind of power can't help. There's not a physical sickness that this power can't heal. There's not an addiction so strong that this power cannot break. We're talking about the Word of God that just spoke in stars and galaxies moved into 
existence. Oh, the overwhelming glory of God that is in this place right now. It's why when the Spirit, you'll run to him. It's the prodigal who said, what did I, what was I thinking? Why did I ever leave? the father's house and he said oh I'm going home I'm going home somebody's coming home today as the prodigal's going home he's like I've got my speech ready I'm going to tell the father how sorry man he's coming home and the father sees him who is a picture of God and the father breaks out and he runs and he embraces his prodigal son and the son's wanting to give the, the I'm sorry the father never even lets him speak He says to everybody, get me a ring, get me a robe, bring me the shoes. The ring will say to everybody, he's my son. The robe, all this stuff, he's covered. The shoes, he's not gonna be renovated and limited. He will have the full rights as a son. There's a destiny for this prodigal. And then he says, get the party ready. My son who was dead is now alive. We are about to celebrate. How awesome is the grace of God? How awesome is the love of God? How great is the grace of God? You can be forgiven. You can be free. You can be made new. You can be a new person today. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, team. Come on, everybody, lift your voice and sing this today. Bow down and say you are God. Sing it with all of your heart. Every man, bow down and say you are king. So let's start. just that strong, but I want to put it around an altar call. Whatever's made you wait, the wait is over for you. No longer resisting, submitting your life. No longer caught in the lie that something else or someone else would satisfy you. No longer allowing past hurt to keep you from the one who can actually heal you. No longer letting loneliness or fear be the narrative. It is time to doubt your doubts. It is time to doubt your doubts. All of that that's been going on, the wait is over. And as we sing this powerfully, passionately again, 
I want you to come to an altar if you need to be saved, if you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. You need freedom in your life. You need God to help you get over something that's happened in the past. Come on. The glory, the grace, the power. It's in this place today. This is your day. Come on, come right now. Come as they sing. Feel this place, God. Feel every heart. I just want to be with you. of your heart, then get ready because God worked from Genesis 3 all the way through to the day of Pentecost to show his heart to be with you. If you want to be in relationship with him, that's why he did all that he did because he longs to be in relationship with you. This is not about religion this is about a relationship that he has done everything to enter your world. <laughs> and now, through surrender, through humility, through just owning how much you need him, you start putting your faith in his grace and the relationship happens. Right now, God, I thank you that as people just say, Jesus, forgive me, that your grace is doing a work right now. Thank you, God. You knew the prayers that are being prayed right now of submission and confession the request for freedom, you knew every one of the, those prayers would be offered up, so you're poised to meet them. Holy Spirit, let hope rise as we think about how great you are. We know that what we're going through right now is not impossible for you. So in that, we have hope in who you are. Thank you for love. Thank you for grace and mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for being available, willing to do life with me. You, Creator God, would be mindful of me, would be aware of me, aware of my need, my name, my life. Thank you that in this grand story, you would choose to be at the center, sacrificing your own life, paying the highest price that we might be in relationship with you. We are humbled, we are honored, we are grateful 
We love you, Jesus. If you've been doubting, bring it to Jesus. Don't let it lead you down a path of deconstruction where you abandon your faith. Bring the doubts to Jesus. Doubt your doubts. There's too much hanging in the balance. The life God has created for you is too important. Don't walk away. Don't get captured in cultural influences that try to diminish, undermine truth, that try to undermine the Bible, the infallible Word of God. It's what will help you. It's what will shape you. It will correct you where you need correction. It will encourage you where you need encouragement. It is the truth that leads to freedom. Walk in it. It takes way more faith to not believe the Genesis 1 account of creation than it does faith to believe in it. Put your faith in God. Put your faith in God. That's, a, that's the best place. That's an eternal place. That is a safe place. Place your faith in God. God Jehovah, God Yahweh, our Lord and our God. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've accomplished today. Church, I think we could sing it again. The King of glory. I, I would encourage you to lift your voice as never before. I want this to be one of the greatest worship moments we've had in the history of the church. Lift your voice. Sing these words from a heart of gratitude, a heart of humility, a heart of wonder. Come on, sing it with all of your heart. Every voice.
give him the best clap offering of gratitude. Come on, keep it going. Come on and praise him. He's a mighty God. He's a great God. Come on, love him with a praise offering. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.